I would suggest that the pandemic is not going to change anything. The future of humanity is not two meters apart. If we learn from history, there have been pandemics in the past. This is not new. And there's a return to normality. Of course, there will be a transition period. That transition period, I suggest, will look as though everything has changed, but really nothing will have changed. The difference will be that all the trends which are apparent now will accelerate. So everything will happen faster. I would suggest that when you see it, you realize that this building could not happen without the Engadine. Is it different in the sense that it doesn't have a pitch roof? Yes. Is it controversial? Is it raising questions? Is it raising discussion? Yes. And if it wasn't doing that, it wouldn't be doing its job. There's been traditionally a thirst for experimentation. And this is an experiment. Already, we are looking for healthier buildings, for a healthier lifestyle. That will move more quickly. And in that sense, the hub will be more relevant than ever. So it doesn't call it into question, quite the reverse. It will encourage its use. It will accelerate. Um, because people will still come together. The lifestyle of the opportunity to have all this and to be able to engage face to face but also digitally, remotely, to connect, that I think, that lifestyle will be accelerated by this pandemic. Uh -huh. So have your work in the last few weeks and months, be, has it been different from the time before? Have you worked differently in any other way with people? I think, um, no, I was working with screens before. I was working manually um, in an analog way drawing, as well as on a screen. Of course, that has accelerated. So I've had more of both and less of moving around from one place to another. But that will come back. Mm -hmm. have have your teams in your offices around the world uh, gone to, to uh, working at home? And have, ha has their work changed fundamentally? I wouldn't say it's changed fundamentally. I think what we've discovered is by a lot of ingenuity, by improvisation, we've discovered that we can be very productive, engaging, across continents on screens. The need for face-to-face -face interaction is absolutely critical. I think you have a flywheel effect. So the projects that we're working on uh, remotely with video conferencing, those are projects which already have a life and they're developing, they're expanding. But a new project where you're starting that there is no substitute for the round table, the different disciplines, the creative process. We are, you know, we're social animals. We can't help it. So I think we've explored and pushed the boundaries of being able to interact creatively digitally. But to repeat myself, that doesn't take away the core need for people to come together face to face. We, you and I, we could be doing this digitally, remotely, on a screen. We're not. We're here, we're on the ground, the sun's shining, 
um, we're interacting. Uh, and I think that, that that has become more precious as a result of this. So a lot of the things that we've taken for granted now become luxuries. I think that we will have a greater sense of value. We will really value that human interaction in the same way that we value the people that perhaps we've taken for granted, the health workers, those who serve us, I mean those who make our lives civilized, literally civilization. You said we are social animals and besides the formal meetings with a certain time frame, a schedule, a room where you meet, there are these informal meetings you have in offices, in universities or museums, uh, that the talk at the coffee maker or the, the, the chat at the water cooler, where sometimes good ideas can, can uh, come out of... I, I would go further. I would say that we are now already designing buildings which deliberately encourage the interaction, the chance meeting. Creativity happens much more scientifically in the social spaces, in the cafes, in the chance meeting in a corridor, far more than in the formal laboratory. And that's not just me as an architect talking. I'm telling you about how a Nobel Prize winning scientists will, will instruct me as an architect to try and create the environment for innovation, for medical breakthroughs. And that is as creative as a painter or a sculptor. So creativity is not just in the artistic domain, it's everywhere. Yeah. So do these social spaces like the cafeterias or the hallways where you meet people this become brings more us, important? This brings us to the hub because the hub is also a meeting place between the locals and the visitors. So you're talking about a new kind of visitor. I suggest that one of the wider implications of the pandemic has been about supply change, uh, chains and questioning perhaps the whole local, global. So just maybe we will have a greater appreciation of the country, of the place that we take for granted and not be so desperate to go somewhere else and in the same way perhaps we'll become more appreciative of a local produce rather than something which is imported. So I think there's another dimension to the hub. Maybe the farmer who sells his produce or the local butcher. Um, so, so maybe we then become much more balanced. We appreciate some things which are global, but we have a greater appreciation of the local. Do you expect the effects of this pandemic into our workspace, into our way we work together to last or will they go away and just be a note in history? I think it's a transition period. I think we'll all be more cautious, so we'll be keeping a distance, the density will be lower. That will also be reflected in the fact that some people will spend more time and continue to work at home but still come in for those things which are critical that we have a face-to-face -face, uh, encounter. And then gradually it will return to a normality. And historians will note that in the great arc of history it really didn't change anything. I mean, if I think to London, I use a bathroom so there's a sanitation system. I go on the Thames embankment and there's a noble thoroughfare. I don't think that was a result of cholera in the middle of the 19th century. It was, but it would have happened inevitably. But many people work in offices where dozens or hundreds of people work in one room on limited space. Will that change? It will seem to change because perhaps not everybody will be doing everything in one place. Um, uh, so there'll be the opportunity for a richer lifestyle uh, where you divide your time, where you might spend time at home and just come in, where you might stagger your, uh, your work life cycle. Um, but again, the hub is, you know, that encourages that tendency because it offers an alternative lifestyle. Of course, 
There are all kinds of things which you can't do away from the workplace. If I think about you know, our own studios around the world, you can't make models remotely. The physicality of a model needs a workshop. We'll single offices when one person in isolated from any possible infection come up again. I, I really do not think that the infection uh, is going to move you to a, a small single office as opposed to a group. Uh, if I think about a project, for example, Apple in Cupertino, that years ago, working with, uh, with Steve Jobs, um, certain tasks a programmer needs a, a monastic-like space. But other groups, work as teams, they need eye contact. So a dealer's floor, um, that's not going to change. It's line of sight, it's proximity, it's quick decision making, interaction between individuals, that's not going to change. Many people have seen now how working from home works, many companies have seen that working from home works and can be quite effectively. Uh, will that change the demand for office space? Will that diminish? It may, I don't think it will change the very nature of it. It might change the extent of it. I think that it also may encourage more social spaces. But already those projects which are pushing the edges, pushing the boundaries. I mean, if I think about projects for, say, Mike Bloomberg, the late Steve Jobs, Comcast, they are ahead of the game in a way. So they're pushing the boundaries. And those workplaces are heavily social. And again, in a way, the hub is that in microcosm. Uh, it is about communality. It is about blurring the edges between lifestyle, the pleasure of having access to greenery, to nature. The appreciation of nature will be enhanced. Um, and those workplaces which already bring nature into the workplace, those will be more desirable. So, but again, all of those tendencies we're aware now, the, the, the pandemic will, will hasten that. And, and so those who've uh, demonstrated the ability to be able to work at home, they will spend more time doing that. But that tendency was already there, so it will be, it will be hastened. Working from home brings effects to the home. How will our homes change if people more and more work at home? Again, I think that the, the more desirable home is almost like the more desirable workplace and the edges get blurred. So ideally, you want your home to offer you the two extremes of communality, where you come together as a, as a family, as a group, but also the individuals have a degree of privacy. And that is not necessarily about the amount of space, it's about the quality of space. It's about acoustic privacy, it's also about having uh, a view. So it's how you maximize the use of space. Mm -hmm. Let's now focus more on the in-hub here in uh, close by to Samores in La Punte. Uh, one of the core ideas is to offer uh, workspace, meeting rooms, gathering people from around the world, uh, also gathering the locals together with the people who come here uh, explicitly for working into the in-hub. Did the last weeks and months and the pandemic change any of the ideas of the in-hub? Did, you, did, you, did it influence the project yet? It, it's almost been like an audit. In other words, if this seemed like a great idea before the pandemic, Given the pandemic, wow, I mean, what a push. We all appreciate the outdoors, nature, the contact with nature, the healthy lifestyle. So the development of the design has been on the one hand, more transparent, more open to the community, more embracing of the community. So much more interacting locally. And at the same time, is also creating kind of inner sanctums. And then 
the idea that if you've got experts from around the world on a subject which is of great public interest, then maybe the equivalent of the kind of uh, village square in the heart of this building could be the opportunity for a debate because that community and the wider region has these incredible individuals, experts in their field who have come together and who share their, their, their knowledge. So, um, so again, I think it has made us more aware, more sensitive to the opportunities that the hub offers. Mm -hmm. So you don't see a risk or a danger of people uh, refraining from, from coming together physically, of, of not wanting to come together physically anymore? The reverse. That is, humanity, the future is not two meter distance between you and I. That may be in transition. And in transition, because of the lower density and because of the open air spaces and the interaction with nature, even if that was the future, this as a project mm -hmm. is still more valid. Yeah. How would you personally describe the typical user of the in-hub? What kind of character is that? Uh, it's somebody who would, who's got a great sense of curiosity, uh, um, has an uh, appreciation and understanding and enjoys the outdoors, wants to engage locally, but also has his or her private world, is hardworking, it's probably almost certainly about future issues. It's uh, inevitably, it's going to touch on those issues which concern all of us, climate change, global warming, um, it's, good, it's going to heighten our sense of awareness of the issues which are critical to all of us, wherever we are. Mm -hmm. How important would you say will the contact to the local people be to the users of the InHub? I think for me that's one of the really exciting aspects of the project. The fact that it is local and global. It's the best of those two, two worlds. And it's a rebalancing of that. So the local becomes more important and the global becomes more important. It's a, it's a new look, it's a new balance, I think, of globalization. I think that's one of the, uh, I wouldn't say the lasting effects. I think that, again, that reappraisal was going to happen because we've seen the way in which globalization has raised living standards generally but has also disadvantaged rural communities, industrial communities, it's created rust belts. So I think that that rebalancing was inevitable, but without question, this pandemic has hastened that. How would you describe the gain for the local people of this exchange with the users of the InHub? This region is, is interesting. I mean, uh, for me, the traditional architecture and a lot of the traditional values are embedded in this, in this region. And the architecture is very special. It's an age before cheap power and electricity. It's a demonstration of how in a wonderfully civilized way you can create a warm environment in a, you know, what at times is uh, climatically very hostile. So in that sense, there's a very strong traditional thread at the same time, it has celebrated technology. If you look at the way the railway systems have penetrated here, if you look at the great hotels which brought, you know, in, in quite a remote location, extraordinarily sophisticated, you know, elevators, electricity, plumbing. And so it, it's, it's always been those, those two worlds. And there's been traditionally a thirst for experimentation. And this is an experiment. Um, uh, you know, how do you, in the ultimately sustainable way, regenerate a community which is, uh, it, which is numerically in decline? But again, there's a paradox here. I was first told about the number of young people who were leaving the, the village. 
And yet my first encounter with the new politicians are the youngest in the community. So, uh, so there's a, a very interesting contradiction there. The people who are most concerned, who are at the forefront politically, are the youngest. Um, that's not to say that also they're leavened out with older, wiser, inevitably, more mature politicians. So I think this as a project cuts across age, cuts across uh, professions. Um, I think it's, it's very much about a forward-looking vision for the, for the future. And in that sense, it is a communal building. Um, it is, it, it, it also comes out of this extraordinary democratic process. Um, so, uh, it, the, 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 you know, if, if, if this happens, it will, be hap it will happen because a community wants it. It will also happen because one or two individuals had a, had a vision. And interestingly, that vision started with the Norman Foster Foundation in Madrid, when one of the two entre entrepreneurs behind the project saw the foundation, saw the way in which different disciplines how young graduates could come from across the world, engage with mentors, top experts in the field, to address issues which, for future civic leaders, climate change, global uh, warming, and, and, and saw the way that those boundaries were dissolved in a foundation which was about anticipating the future. That was really the the, the generator of the, of the project. So, you know, when I was approached about this project, I mean, for me, it was, you know, it was my perfect project. It was about the future. You have described the project as cutting across different things. It also cuts across designs and, and, uh, and styles of architecture, and it is uh, controversially discussed. How would you describe your project as you designed it as part of this old village? I'd say that it couldn't have happened without the local culture. I mean, when I presented it in the town hall, I talked openly about the inspirations. I talked about the paint especially, I talked about the landscape, talked about the indigenous architecture um, and how one could, could learn from that in the quest to create spaces which are about creativity, about regeneration, about rediscovery. So something that would hopeless, you know, hopefully be, uh, be timeless in, it, in its architecture. And a building that would attract visitors um, uh, and would be inspirational as an example to other communities. What do you say to people who criticize the architecture, your design with these roundish forms and the, and the very special shape of the, of the roof, uh, people who say it should look more like the old Engadin house? I would suggest that when you see it, you realize that this building could not happen without the Engadin. Is it different in the sense that it doesn't have a pitch roof? Yes. Are there certain buildings in the communities here, the church, which traditionally doesn't have that pitch roof shape, has a much more sculptural rounded shape, is where people came together because it had a civic significance? Yes. Um, is it controversial? Is it raising questions? Is it raising discussion? Yes. And if it wasn't doing that, it wouldn't be doing its job. Thank you very much for sharing your time and your ideas with us, Lord Norma Foster. Thank you. you.